Welcome to Sepsa Talk. I am Evans Apia Kisi, the host of Sepsa Talk. Sepsa is Center for Better Society, Advocacy, and Research Africa. It's a non-profit organization that believes in a better society for all. We in Sepsa Africa believe that a better society begins with you. Hashtag a better society begins with you and I. For more information, please log on to www.sepsaafrica.org. Please follow us on Sepsa Talk YouTube, at Facebook, Sepsa Africa, Instagram, Sepsa Africa, Twitter, at Sepsa Africa. Today, we bring you a very interesting discussion on the topic women and leadership in Africa. When it comes to competences that are relevant to holding leadership roles in various sectors of an economy, most people do not distinguish between men and women, though we may see clear strengths over each other in some key areas. In fact, in most studies, women seem to score higher marks for leadership skills than men. However, a disturbing evidence is that the percentage of women in top leadership positions in areas such as politics and corporations remain constant in the last decades in both the global north and global south. In this episode, we highlight key barriers for African women seeking leadership roles, but we also provide evidence of how some women in Africa have broken through and show their contributions to various sectors of the economy. And to help us discuss this very important issue are Mrs. Yoyo Opoku. Her expertise lies in writing and real estate investing. She is a contract manager at the MTA Department of Buses Para Transit. She holds an MPA in public administration from Long Island University, USA. And she holds a BA in English Literature from the City College, USA. Mrs. Opoku, welcome to SEPSA Talk. Thank you, thank you for having me. Great, we're grateful to have you. Our next guest for today is Mrs. Akosia Jima. She's a social and human rights advocate, legal and political analyst, a researcher, and a writer. She holds a Master of Social Work at Carleton University, Canada, an MA in Human Geography and Resource Development at the Western University, London, Canada. She also holds LLM in Diplomacy and International Law, Lancaster University, England. She holds a BA in Human and Resources Development at University of Ghana, Ghana. Her expertise lies in foreign policy, social policy, international relations, geopolitics, human rights, and international law. She's obviously not new to SEPSA Talk. We have had her a few times. And today, we are also happy to host you. Welcome once again to SEPSA Talk, Mrs. Jima. Very happy to be here. Thank you so much for having me again. Thank you. Our next guest is Mrs. Regina Fidelia A. Lassi. She's currently a doctoral researcher in management with the option of HRM at Wilden University, USA. She holds an MPhil in management at the Wilden University, USA. She also holds an MBA from Keller Graduate School of Management, USA a BSc in Business Administration, KNUS in Ghana. She's Management Analyst, MTA New York City Transit, Sirota Agency in USA. Her expertise lies in finance, human resource management, general management, diversity, and inclusion. We are so grateful to host you, Ms. Lassie. Welcome to SEPSA Talk. Thank you for having me. I'm great to be here. It's a pleasure. And our final guest for today, she's an engineer. She's Araba Amu Edu. She's an energy engineer. She is the regional president for women in engineering 
She's also the secretary of the Ghana Institute of Engineering, the Ashanti Regional Branch. She is known to be the youngest serving female national council member until her doctoral <laughs> studies. She's currently a doctoral researcher in agricultural engineering at the University of Kassel in Germany. She holds an MNC in renewable energy technology from the KNUSD in Ghana, a BSc in mechanical engineering from KNUSD Ghana. Her expertise includes advocacy and energy analysis. Ms. Amu Edu, welcome to SEPSA Talk. Thank you. Great. And um, viewers, thank you once again for spending time to listen to SEPSA Talk. I can assure you that today you would really enjoy the show as we bring in the perspective of these great women. And I'm also very happy to host all of you. And let me once again welcome all of you to SEPSA Talk. Great, so we'll just start right away and I would like to begin with you, Miss Lassie. And as we saw in the synopsis that we, we read, in most cases you find out that women who are capable or even more than capable are normally in short supply at, at the top of government and business or education and research, what have you. And the question we want to ask you is that why why are women often in short supply you know when it comes to occupying these very important positions thank you very much for the question um first of all i would like to welcome all our viewers and listeners to the program um when we talk about women being in short supply especially in africa we are looking at various factors. And the first of all, which is almost obvious, is the underlying generational culture that makes, uh, that assumes that women belong to the kitchen. In other words, women are homemakers. Um, the common adage that we normally hear is, this is how we do it, and this is how we've done it from time immemorial. So we see women getting a lot of pushbacks when it comes to they wanting to further the education or trying to achieve anything other than being a homemaker. So with that cultural mindset, it makes it very difficult for women to make it on your own, especially those who rely on support from their family members and friends. Uh, this leads me to the next topic, which is the lack of basic human rights to education for women. So there was this quote made by Dr. Kwaju Agri, that if you educate a man, you educate one person, but if you educate a woman, you educate a nation. This is in synchrony with the first point of the culture of making women homemakers. So he was trying to, from my understanding, this could be linked to the fact that if a homemaker is educated, then they are able to further educate the children under, under their care, or better still, anyone in, 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 in the family thereof. Um, if you go to certain parts of Africa, girl-child education is so much put to the curb. It's like it's of no benefit to the society, as they say to the extent that when families can even afford to send their girl child um, to school, they would rather put them on hold and then educate the men instead. And this is what happens um, causing all this systematic uh, lack of support. And so women need extra cushion to bring us to the level of commitment since the system has relegated women to the sidelines to watch the game, cheer on, and not be part of it. Other um, factors are also early marriages that is preventing women from pursuing their academic goals. For instance, when a woman is going to school so much, they ask you, so when are you going to get married? What are you waiting for? Your biological clock is ticking. And all these to just discourage the woman from pursuing their education or going for higher goals in life. And when these women are able to go, you know, get married, 
There is another problem with the lack of uh, support from their spouses. Now you find a lot of women that we speak to telling us that their spouses are, oh, why don't you take your time? You know, just wait, I have children and then you can continue. Why the children come in? Why are you in a rush to go to school? Why don't you take care of the kids? And then the woman might wait for a year or two and then it looks like they are the only people who are supposed to take care of the children. There is no support in most of the time helping the women to balance education and taking care of the kids and home. There is also the primitive mindset of masculinity superiority, that the man is better than the woman. And so the men get most opportunities than the women do get. Um, there is also boundaries that has been set for women not to go beyond the average level. So there's a backlash as once the woman tries to break the ceiling. Um, there's also the stagnant culture practices which promotes retrogress in women empowerment to the extent that even some religion do not allow women to be able to ascend certain positions. And so all these form the mindset that is putting the women down and not allowing them to pursue higher courses. Um, women, as they say, are to be seen, are to be heard and not to be seen. So, uh, sorry, the other way around. So they want to see you as a woman, but you cannot speak. And when we are talking about the barriers or the challenges that women are facing in leadership roles, um, there is these, uh, the threats to the, their male counterparts. Um, this comes about when male think that, oh, if the woman is given the opportunity, she is going to come and jump on all of us, which of course, it's, it's something which is planning from the cultural point of view. There is lack of leadership opportunities for women to rise. Since they've curbed um, an average height for you, this is how far you can go. And there is almost little opportunities for women. In positions when men are considered for based on not their abilities or their experiences, certain positions men are able to apply for and get it based on aspirations or um, ability to maybe your potential. Women have to try twice as much as hard. They have to show credentials. They have to show that they've done it before and they are not just um, hired based on maybe your potential or you can do it whilst the men are able to do that. There is also in the um, political atmosphere, the Machiavellian style interruptions. So when you, in politics mostly, the men are self-centered. It's not about teamwork. It's not about helping or pushing the women. It's about we taking the lead. And so if you find yourself in such a hostile environment, it's almost impossible for you to make it. A typical example is what we are seeing in Ghana with the backlash of a woman being chosen as a, a running mate for a political party. This is not the first time this has happened. And anytime a woman rises to such a position, you see all these backlashes coming out. Why? Because it's a woman. Now there is also the boundaries that are um, set, um, preventing the women from achieving all these aims. And so um, when we talk about the reasons why women are not able to rise to these um, top academic and research in government and businesses in Africa. These are the few things that we think. Mm. Mm. Thank you, thank you very much. But I just wanted to um, follow up with uh, something that you just said. You said lack of basic human rights to education, but is this still persistent in the African continent? I thought they have moved past that. It might, it could be cultural, but I mean, at the national level, do we still have problem with, you know, basic rights to education? Oh, yes, we still do. So what we have to realize is that since it's still cultural, people still have that thought, okay? That they feel that um, the girl child, you know, you can go, the best they can give you is for your basic, but you cannot go beyond certain levels because if there is um, constraint that we need to share resources for, um, our children to go to school. You could see that the men get the most opportunities and the women are like the excess of the fans. So if there is an opportunity, like if there is a choice to be made, a man is chosen first before a woman. 
Mm. And then my, maybe my last one before I move to Mrs. Opoku, you, I think you some way, somehow already touched on this, but is it also the case that in most cases, women are held, you know, at higher standards, you know, when they are seeking these leadership roles in comparison to men or? Yes, yes. So men, normally you could get a position based on your potential, what you can be able to do. But in most cases, you find out that women have to prove that they can really do it. So you need to prove with years and years of experience. Meanwhile, a man, you know, a man can come out of school and then they look at your potential. And just by mere fact that you are masculine, it is assumed that you are able to um, pursue this process. Especially um, for a typical example is certain jobs are, are, are just really uh, reserved for men. Like women in engineering, women in construction, um, you, you are thought of as if you're going to um, be taking breaks, mm -hmm. you know, childbirth and all that. But in the West, we have paternity leave too. So now this brings us to a leverage of some sort. Um, so it, it's still a persistent still, issue. True, true. Thank you. Thank you very much, Miss Lasse, for your wonderful contribution and i come to you mrs opoku as we've heard from miss Lasse. so the whole lot of constraints i mean major one being cultural reasons why women you know find it very difficult to seek leadership roles in various areas but we also know that i mean there are some few women who have broken through this 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 very tough ladder if, if you would like to call it and for you who are these few women that you know of who have broken through in senior leadership roles in businesses and corporation how did they do that and what, what were some of their contributions oh thank you again for having me on this platform and to add to what miss lassie has said that yes we do experience some roadblocks and as they call it black ceilings in the corporate workplaces and there are a few women who break into that higher uh, management and ceo positions Currently in the U.S., there are no black female CEOs running a Fortune 500 company, which is, you know, shocking. The last one that we had was Ursula Burns, who was the CEO of Xerox, and then she stepped down in 2016. Um, since then, in America, no black female CEOs of a this Fortune is, 500 This company. is very interesting. In the U.S., yes. no black female CEO of a fortune 500 company running big companies um and i think that goes to say that a lot of women have started their own businesses because of this lack of opportunities to move up and become ceos of companies um when i was researching ursula burns stories to find out why exactly she left and you know the company was going through a restructuring but some of the roadblocks that she experienced was again um discrimination not only is she a female, but she's also a black woman, you know, that she has to run and operate a business where there are, of course, different races and ethnicities. And some of the challenges that she faced were, of course, microaggressions, um, discriminate, discrimination, um, just having resources as far as networking with people is sometimes a roadblock. Um, and some of the ways that we can challenge or break through those roadblocks is having mentorships. I think a good part of it is having someone that looks like you in those positions that you can aspire to and hopefully, you know, reach that potential in your career. Um, another thing is tooting your own horn. I'm a big proponent of that. Um, never being shy away for recognizing your accomplishments. I think men do a great job of boasting and beating their chest whenever they do something, even if it's wrong. So women also have to take that page out of the book and, you know, toot your horn, you know, always have an opportunity to lead with your accomplishments and don't shy away from circles. I, I'm a big proponent in increasing your circles. I think as women, sometimes we look for other women too, to probably mentor, but men can be a good mentor you know, men can also provide the good mentorship as well. Um, what else can I add? But as far as CEOs and women and trying to break through, 
I, I, I heavily believe that now in 2020, there is a great opportunity for us to do that. You know, the Me Too movement has highlighted it. The Black Lives Matter has highlighted a lot of, you know, um, opportunities for us and a lot of opportunities for business owners to recognize that people of color, minority women can be in upper management and run big companies. Thank you very much. But uh, maybe also just um, a follow up. It's quite shocking, the revelations that we have. And I'm sure uh, as a black woman in the US and where you only are able to give just one example who unfortunately has also even resigned. So mm -hmm. which means we do not have any example. I'm sure this is the story across Africa as well, where it will be very difficult to identify a particular woman who is a CEO in a big corporation. But one of the things you mentioned is the opportunity now for women to run their own businesses and become their own CEOs. But how is that also, is it doing well? Do we have a lot of women who have been able to achieve that at the moment, running their own corporations, no matter how small it is? Oh, uh, I mean, I can say a number of entrepreneurs who are coming up do, doing, you know, phenomenal in their business as far as product and services. Um, I mean, we put aside some of the celebrities who's also ventured out and done businesses like um, Serena Williams. I mean, we all know her as the famous tennis player, but now she's all going into retail. Rihanna, who's a, of course, a famous singer who's now also going into makeup and retail. Um, but just even small business owners like um, Lisa Price, who uh, was the CEO of Carol's Daughter. Of course, she now sold it. Um, there, there are so many um, young women out here mm. doing phenomenal things with products and services, um, from head wraps to shea butter to retail African clothing. Um, I can probably go on and on mm -hmm. with you know, the number of oh, people definitely. of women who have striked out and said that, you know what, maybe I need to start my own business. Me, for example, uh, I have a full-time job, but I also write, you know, I'm an author. And then I'm also an investor in real estate because I find that, you know, there's so many opportunities to grow and become successful in this mm -hmm. world mm -hmm. besides, you know, um, having a nine to five. Yeah. All right. So th thank you very much. And then maybe you say that one of the ways with which, you know, women are able to achieve this would be to um, seek mentorship and also, I, I want to say, blow their own trumpet, so to say, <laughs> because men do that a lot. <laughs> anyway, so I, I, I come to you, Mrs. Jima, and um, I'm sure we would have quite a few examples when it comes to politics, because we want you to touch on who these few women who have broken through in senior leadership role in politics and, and how did they do that? Do we know of any qualities that aided them in achieving this feat? That's a big question. And I think the rest of them highlighted a number of issues. Um, in general, I just would like to highlight a few things. I don't think that Africa is necessarily unique in terms of women being marginalized and occupying a very small or are constituting a very small percentage of people that are in leadership position. Uh, I would highlight a few numbers here. I was going through the literature and I found that uh, even though the majority, the majority of people that hold our uh, degrees, whether it is um, a master's, uh, especially bachelor's degrees, the majority are women. And then there is a large number of women that also hold master's degree. However, only about a quarter of, of leadership positions globally are occupied by women in general. And, and the other part of it is, um, women constitute about 50% of the labor force and the majority of these women are college graduates. And, and keep in mind that uh, a quarter, so, 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 so women constitute a majority, at least more than 50% of, of undergrad uh, graduates and a very good proportion of the masters, but then only a quarter are, are globally. And uh, in politics, and I'll come back to your question in a minute, in politics, for example, 
women constitute globally about 25% of, of, of members of parliament. And then the women occupy 21% of uh, ministerial positions. Uh, also, globally, um, as my other colleague had mentioned, I believe Mrs. Apoku mentioned uh, uh, a few things around um, women uh, in SMP. Uh, the World Economic Forum did a report, I believe that was in 2019. The report was to measure um, a gender gap. And what they found was out of their 158 countries, only 68 of them have had women leaders in the last 50 years. The other thing they found was in Africa, 22% um, of, of, of cabinet people are women. And then 25% of, uh, of, of parliamentarians in Africa are women. Uh, and then in the corporate world, they found that about 25% of women in 2019 in the US were, uh, they were on board positions. But when it comes to the CEOs, which is alluding to what my other colleagues have said, only about 4% in general of women occupy senior leadership positions. Uh, um, i.e. CEOs, what they call level C, uh, chief operating officers, chief executive officers, all the C words, all, like, all the top positions, 4%. Um, in 2015, uh, what they found was top board leadership positions, 7.5% were women. And between 2015, uh, 2015, that was 7.4%, but 2019, it only increased by 0.1%. Um, one of the other things they also found was in their uh, fields, they call the STEM fields, which is science and technology and um, uh, math and engineering too. Uh, the majority uh, of, of, of them are men. Um, you talked about uh, the women that broke the ceiling, what helped? I think one of the barriers that uh, actually stops women from occupying the positions, again, it, uh, a lot of it has been highlighted by my two colleagues there, so I wouldn't like to repeat it. I think that um, what, one of the problems are, in general, leadership positions are supposed to be uh, like masculine position, like they make it like you have to almost like assert male, male traits. You have to be strong. You have to be assertive uh, before you can kind of become strong enough. Um, uh, on the other hand, when a woman, particularly a black woman, is strong enough, then they're seen as aggressive, almost like threatening to the rest of them. And, and in particular, I think it's more, this is where the difference comes in, in terms of Africa. Uh, uh, it is more pronounced. And, and oftentimes, I think that even though, uh, I, 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 when I was in school years ago, I wrote a paper about multiple jeopardy. Multiple jeopardy meaning if you were a woman and black and immigrant, and you also have an accent, that means you've got multiple, multiple uh, forms of discrimination against you. So the more of these traits you have, the a lot is against you. So when it comes to uh, back to the role being uh, leadership role being perceived as a man being strong, as you know, many of these are cross generations for ages. Men are considered as leaders. For example, they're considered as leaders in houses. And most Africans, when I'm having conversations, a lot of times I'm very shocked. They automatically assume that a man should be ahead. I keep on arguing. So if the man is unemployed. The man is bad with money. They should still be the head managing money. If the man is weak and the woman is strong, the man should still be the head. And so it, it is almost like automatic. When, and then there is the cultural thing around when you're even in a household. I am among five boys and I'm the oldest. Uh, in my family, it's not so much. But you see that the broader family, the extended family, they sort of sideline you, forgetting that I'm the oldest they automatically assume something happens. My brothers who are much younger should assume leadership role. They should be. I should just stay behind them and have them speak. 
I keep on saying, so then does that mean that your knowledge counts? It's like once you're a woman, your knowledge doesn't count. So I keep on, again, I keep on wondering. So does that mean that if there is a man, you're wet and they're illiterate? The man is illiterate. They didn't go to school as much as you did. No disrespect to men. But if the man has, let's say, lived in a small place, we all know that your worldview counts a lot in terms of what you know. Your experience counts. Your education counts. Your exposure counts. But then in Africa, it is almost as if once you have a male figure, a male uh, organ, I call it, once somebody has male features, automatically they are wiser, they are a leader, they are supposed to lead everything. And I think in Africa in particular, that stops the women. And so you're supposed to, even if you know, you are a threat to people. So you're mm -hmm. supposed to play this uh, almost like supporting role uh, to the men. You're supposed to step aside and still make a man who is more intelligent, be the, uh, I'm sorry, probably less intelligent, probably less, less, uh, less experienced. You're supposed to step aside and have them deal with. You're even supposed to tell them Probably if you know more, you tell the man to present it. So, so that, that concept, I think, bothers us in terms of those that have made it. I think some of us, personally, I can speak to the fact that I'm not too bothered about what people say because they would label you. I think that if you're going to be uh, uh, bothered about how people label you, about being aggressive, they have all kinds of names. If you speak up, you're dominating, you're walking over your husband, you're walking over your brothers. So, so that perception, I think the women that make it, they're more comfortable, I feel, that's how I see it. They're more comfortable with their looks. They're more comfortable with what people, they're, they're willing to speak and they're uh, willing to speak up. They're willing to also confront the men uh, and not so much about um, uh, alienating the men, but they're more comfortable in terms of having a discussion with them to, to, to try and educate them. I think that's what those men do, those men do. I think the idea around what Mrs. Okoku spoke around having a sponsorship or having almost like a networking, I think those women tend to hang out with the men more. They tend to sort of learn, they tend to be bold. They tend to also, again, they tend to speak up for themselves. And I think that's what makes it different and of course, I think education is a big part of it. I think that if you are more educated, you have more experience, you have more exposure, it, it sort of feeds into your confidence. You're more confident because then you know you know. Although other people might find it threatening, other people may criticize you, but I think the more you learn, the more experience you are, the more confident you are. So I would say in summary, those women probably tend to have more knowledge they tend to have learned a lot. They tend to have associated with men or they have a strong family that supported them no matter what. And then they are very absolutely confident in themselves. So I think that's what makes that difference. Thank you, I think, thank you very much. But just uh, one follow up. Um, I think one of the things I got is that these women, as you described, usually are confident and some also be construed them to be aggressive but in politics is it fair to say that most of the women who have broken through are usually you know aggressive and arrogant or it's just that they are only confident and are not bothered by what people say i think that as you can see normally a man picked them up so so they have to have in 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 most cases even if the woman steps up on their own, you could see that a lot of these women are still living in the shadow of another man. So it has to be often a man that is well-liked, maybe a leader that is well-liked, and also pro-gender, right? Gender equality, that pick those women. So when they pick those women, you could even see that the women are scrutinized more. They're scrutinized for their looks. They're scrutinized for what they're wearing. And so the people, even sometimes you, you, you post something and then what people are commenting on is what you look like, right? So, so, so you have to still even assuming these leadership roles, particularly in Africa, in general, it is like that across the globe. Uh, but then in Africa, it is more about, yes, you have to be strong, but you almost have to play a role that appeals to men to like you. You have to present yourself like, 
people must like you as a feminine person. So you can be confident, but you can't really, and I get into that a lot because people expect you not to speak up bluntly like this. You have to almost like try and the, the idea of almost like obedience and, and, and subservience and humility. So a lot of Africans are fine. If you're a very confident woman, they mistake that to be rude and arrogant and, and they, they label you essentially. So even those in Africa I think that are successful, they're still, as you know, uh, one, one interesting thing, many of the women, uh, I understand many of the women in politics are placed in cultural, like ministry, ministry of culture, ministry of education. So they don't put them in different. They don't put them in the roles that are uh, traditionally supposed to have more power, like defense, like um, almost like it's surprising. Ghana has done pretty well with foreign affairs, for example. They put women there. But typically, they put men in those areas. Ministry of Defense, the top military person is often a man. Mostly top police officer is a man. Uh, so all these positions where you carry more power, still men occupy it because the idea is that the woman should still remain almost like you are second to a man mm. so even mm. though those in those positions they still have to be humble a humble meaning you can't really speak quote unquote aggressively a man speaks mm. like that is considered as an asset so they're strong they're a strong leader and they're liked for being tough a man a man speaks softly like that they're gonna be oh a weak leader they can't be a good leader. But if you're a woman, you speak like that. Oh, wow, she is very emotional and, and she's an aggressive woman. So it could be taken either way. So those women, you could see it, Ministry of Arts, Ministry of Entertainment or whatever that is. The, they're, they're women friendly areas. And even if you look at uh, professions that are dominated by women, I often ask, even in this country, in Canada, I even ask, most nurses are, are women, but then you see that the nursing manager is a male person. Most social workers are females, but then the chief executive is a male social worker. Like the, the hospital or the healthcare is dominated by, by women. But then the CEO, almost all the time, the majority are men. So, so again, you asked about uh, women in politics there, they still have to play nice. Because as in Ghana, if you're watching the Ghanaian politics, which I do follow these days, the, you could see that the women dare not talk. The women in it, when they speak up, almost all the time, they are sort of almost like rebuked. Mm. They're almost mm. insulted. Not so much for the substance, but a woman is not supposed to speak like that. They should have come and soft spoken. Oh, please, I beg you, don't do that. Instead of saying, no, you, you did something wrong, you mm. should stop. Mm. They don't expect you, a woman, to speak like that. You are too aggressive. And you're not, that's not African. That's not right. You still should stay there. So just to summarize, those women, I think, are still living in the shadows of, of men. And they're supposed to walk this fine line to be liked in order to survive. If they become very assertive, they're really, really, I, I would say they're looked at in a very negative fashion, whereby a man can get away with it. That's my opinion. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Mrs. Chima, for that. Now I come to you, Ms. Um, Amo Edu. And I mean, starting from where Mrs. Chima ended, for her, you know, women in politics who have made it still live in the shadows of, of men, and you need to be bold and confident. You need not to be bothered by what people will say, as we know, in politics. But my question to you is, in terms of education also, we know that there are a lot of difficulties, which Ms. Lassie has already touched on it. But we also know a few women who have re really done well, risen through the ranks in education and research. What worked for them? Who, who are these women and what played out for them? Oh, thank you, thank you, thank you. First of all, I'd like to say it's an honor and a pleasure to finally be on Substance Talk. I have been following you for some time. You're doing a great work. So thank you to you and your team thank for you this also. platform. And um, I accepted your invitation because I think you are talking about a present issue and SEPSA has, uh, can contribute to making um, or advocating 
to a wider audience on the issues on the ground concerning gender. Um, my simple explanation of gender is this of feminism. I will take it from that angle. Um, discriminating somebody based on sex. Okay. I think that everybody deserves equal opportunity based on merit, not based on sex. And I think that is why we're all gathered here. I'd also like to thank my fellow participants. It's a very great pool, very well accomplished women. So kudos to all of you. And mm -hmm. uh, your life alone is already making the difference. And so it's not that terrible since we have you as mentors and examples to look up to. I agree. Um, <laughs> yes, when you were mentioning the baggage, I was, I was very impressed. So following Ms. Um, Mrs. Opoku's cue, I am addressed as engineer because I'm a professional engineer, but the host chose to call me Miss. <laughs> so this is a typical example of tooting your own horn. Yes. Okay. So um, go ahead, blow it. Yes, yes. This is a very good opportunity. Yes, and so um, I would take it from the global perspective, and um, I think the gender roles um, became predominantly clear or marginalized from the Cold War era up until now when the men had to go to war and when the men didn't want to go and the women had to go, we had similar experiences in, in Africa, specifically Ghana, I would speak for Ghana as well. When we had, the men were tired, the men were scared and the woman rose up to the challenge. And so no matter how the narrative is painted, women are making a difference. They may not be celebrated enough, they may not be seen, but traditionally, women are leaders because to manage a home alone, it's, it's a taxing, it's a daunting task. And so I would like to say, first of all, the situation is not that bad, but maybe or not, we have not managed to sell our achievements like our other counterparts. And, and there's room for everybody. I don't, I don't see this as a competition against a male and a female. I think that there's room for everybody and all heads are needed to be on the table. That's why we're having this conversation to begin with. Um, I would like to take it from the, the gender inequality index. This is how the United Nations measures um, from the human development index to see how a nation is progressing. And we brought in the inequality indexes, but now for, so for the purpose of today's discussion, I like to see, see it from the gender inequality index. This is a measure of a country's inequality based on gender. And I was surprised to find um, Ghana to be 133. I, I thought Ghana was doing well considering the, the, the agendas and the programs and the seemingly acceptance of female leadership. 133 out of, are you able to tell us? Out of 168 countries. Okay, thank you. Yes. And uh, Rwanda is 95, mm. and this is an African country. Uh, Iceland is number one, Norway is number five. But just to put it in context, South Africa is 113. Um, just to put it in context, I just want us to picture how everybody else is doing because the global issue, Nigeria is 157 in West Africa. And so it is possible to bridge the gap because if Rwanda, which is recovering from a genocide, can rise to number 95 and they are still rising, then we can do something about our situations. And so um, I would like to say there's room for everybody. And as Ms. Lassie rightly said, um, mentorship is very important. And I would like to say that this is supposed to also mentioned um, tooting your own horn. It is um, not a cultural thing in our context to toot our own horn. And sometimes you find um, women coming to interviews and they are downplaying their achievements. Mm. It, 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 it almost does not, I don't understand it. You're coming to sell yourself for a position and you are downplaying your own achievements. And it's, that is seen cultural, that is seen respectful. And so we have, we have, serious cultural issues to tackle 
and and I think we are doing a good job, but we can do better. Uh, there was this he for she program by the Ministry of Gender, which was very helpful, but it didn't go far. I think they could have implemented that more so that in, in the case where like a program like this, that we have women saying their experiences and what they think of the issue, you have only men doing the advocacy who feel that is the right thing to do because it's a basic fundamental human right. And that really, really was making significant impact. But uh, the program was discontinued. So if we could, we could encourage programs like that. So it doesn't look like you are overreacting, you are blowing your own horn. Mm. It's not that bad. When a, a fellow or a colleague male sees that this is wrong and they actually speak to the issue, okay. then it, it, it also helps. And then um, uh, for, for, the, for academia, there are a lot of issues rising in academia and uh, trying to live. Um, I, will, I will speak to maybe engineering. That is my background. Mm -hmm. That um, it is a very lonely, it's a very lonely path. Some people think it's um, yeah, to be the only this, the first this, it's a very, very lonely and uncharted path. And I don't think anybody would wish that, but this is where we find ourselves. And so I remember in, um, in 2016, we undertook a project based on experience as a, as a lecturer that uh, for, for consistently for about since 2013 to 2016, I had, no, I had not had any female students. And this was becoming a problem to be the only mem female member of staff in the mechanical engineering department. Mm. And for years, nobody opts for my section. So we did the research and we found out some few interesting um, scenarios. And this is strictly in the Ashanti region. I'm speaking to my region. Mm. And we found out that from the basic level, the primary level, the girls do tremendously well. They are very confident because of the VSHS and all those packages, it is seemingly balanced that everybody seemingly goes to school. And then we realize that when we get to the, from the secondary to the bachelor level, the girls start or the females start to drop. Now from the masters to the doctorate level, then it is marginally significantly different. So the issue was what happened during the rise. And what we found out was that primarily the issues were cultural. Mm. As Ms. Lassie said, most of the women were fearing they could not get married. They would not be accepted in their societies. If they rise too much, they would be seen as chauvinist and egoistic. And so it is more of a self-sabotage. And I would not blame them because we, those who are broken through the ranks, don't do a good job at tooting our own horn. And so these women do not see the role models. And as, you, as I said, it's a very lonely chart and nobody wants to walk that path. So if you are not seeing what you want to be out there, then you don't want to. The parents don't do a good job, as she rightly said, when there is, um, you know, funds that have to be divided between daughters and sons, of course, you would give them to the sons. But not all homes are like that. Mm. I mean, not all backgrounds are like that. I've had mm. very, very welcoming and strong um, network of men who mm. have pushed me and helped me to be where I am and even further. And, and so I strongly believe in the he for she approach. Mm -hmm. And I also believe that um, we can't do better. The situation is not as dire as it seems, if we do what we have to do. Yes. So okay. a few names who have broken through the ranks. Mm -hmm. I will give um, our very own recently nominated vice president, uh, vice presidential candidate, Professor mm -hmm. Nana. Jean. She's has a double doctorate. Um, uh, Professor Mrs. Ritao Poku Dixon, just, uh, she just got elected as the vice chancellor of King Kwame Kwame University of Science and Technology. Um, we have Mrs. Chinri Hesse, she has been a diploma uh, from the diplomatic hall since 2002. 
and she is the uh, currently the chancellor of the University of Ghana. Mm. Uh, later on, um, Professor Mrs. Asiwa, she was the former um, vice chancellor of uh, Sunyani, uh, Sunyani Energy University. Yes, she did a tremendous job, and she was even a council member for the Ghana Institution of Engineers for years. Um, Justice Georgina Wood, she was at education when the Venezuela cocaine saga came up mm. and she brought unity to the country because this issue was so sensitive, it was tearing the country apart. True. And True. if you say politics, you have Theresa May. If it had not been for her, this Brexit deal was, was going bankers and she mm. came in at the right time to tie the knot Great. and did her job well. I, I don't intend to cut you in, but you, you said a few things that I. I wanted to follow up on that. I, I get the sense that what has worked for this woman is similar to what uh, Mrs. Chima and Mrs. Opuku already pointed out to some extent. But if you don't mind, because you, you are as an engineer, engineer and also a lecturer, what, what peculiar thing also has worked for you, you know, besides what you've already touched on and what has been touched on by other panelists here? What, what exactly, is there anything you think worked for you to be able to get to where you are? Hmm. That's, a, that's a tough question because it's a, it's a variety of factors. Hmm. Okay. <laughs> I think, I think uh, predominantly my faith, okay. um, my faith in God, and I love what I do. I love it. I try to stop it, but I just love it. And I have a very positive network, a very okay. strong network. That okay will not allow you to go otherwise. Mm. And I have mentors. I usually look for mentors who are in my present situation, who can identify with everything I have. Mm. And then I follow with okay, them. So, so I get the other two, which now has not been touched on. That's the passion that you, you have for the job and of course your, your faith as well. Before we get to the second round, where we look at, if you like, how we can help to you know, improve the participation of women in various leadership roles. We have someone on the line. He's, he's one of our regular panelists, Edmond, who would like to ask one or two questions. Um, Edmond, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Can you hear me? Yes, we can also hear you. And then, yeah, you said you had one or two questions to ask our panelists here. Go yeah, ahead. I don't know who to address the question to specifically, but I will just put the question across and I would love to hear what you think about this. Because in your submission, you were talking about it's time for women to brag. And then there is this first this and first that syndrome. And I find it a little bit um, discouraging or daunting for young people because, for example, if I say I'm the only black person to do this, in one way, one would say you are give, bragging or giving a positive light of say you are a female and you are the only female doing that. But in the other way, it also appears to young people that you need to be that special. So for me, I put it here, is it like a role model versus a superwoman model? Because a superwoman model will alienate a lot of people thinking, okay, I don't have what it takes to be that superwoman. So I want to know how do you how do you advise young ladies to exhibit confidence without being arrogant, arrogant, or to navigate through this um, role model versus superwoman model thing, so that I don't hope to see okay, Araba maybe she might be so smart that's why she's an engineer, and if I don't feel myself that special, then I think well it's not my portion. So how do we demystify this? That's my question. Okay, thank you very much. And uh, yeah, so who would like to go first? Mrs. Opoku. <laughs> well, I think it takes a combination of humbleness as well as, you know, tooting your own horn. I don't think you need to walk around and say, oh, I'm the first, or I'm the best, or I'm this. I think your actions and your experiences should speak for itself as well. But never feel shy or run away from the opportunity to express or to tell people what you do and how you go about doing it. Um, like I said, there is a, a really good line between being arrogant and being humble mm -hmm. and also making sure that whatever you're saying is, you can back it up, you know? My mom always say, walk the walk and talk the talk. 
So if you're someone who's, you have your credentials and you've done X, Y, and Z, um, you have sales numbers to prove it because numbers don't lie, obviously, right? So if you can say that, oh yeah, in this quarter, I produced this amount of revenue, you're not being arrogant. You're basically, you're stating facts and you have, you know, the mojo, I want to say, to prove it or back it up. So definitely, um, there is there is a there is a line where you should never cross and be too arrogant because like you said you were eyeing certain people from probably approaching you or you know categorizing you as being a showboat but um never be afraid to um create the facts mm. that's in my opinion thank you very much mrs opoku any other inputs um yes i would like to come in here go ahead please to address the fact about um, seeing you as a superwoman or you being a new person or the fact that you need to do something significantly big to be considered as achieving, I would say that it's very, very subjective because something which looks bigger to somebody is to be the starting point for another person. So I really believe in celebrating your successes, either large, small, enjoy the journey, every part of the step. You need to just celebrate yourself. In it. And what makes you a superwoman? It depends on the goal you are setting for yourself. Maybe your goal is to achieve A and B at a certain point in time, and then you, you came across the roadblocks. Those roadblocks might mean nothing to somebody, but the fact that it was a very huge hurdle for you to jump, it's enough for you to celebrate it and it's enough for you to be confident in it and say hey i did it and this could uh, encourage other people to do the same thing thank you very much miss lassie for your input as well um if i don't know if engineer araba also yes. would like to add some go ahead please then yeah i, I just wanted to to add the last comment that um, I don't think that any of the panelists, when you list the accomplishments, they are quite huge, Very feels huge. that they have arrived yet. Mm. I, I, I speak for all of us. I think that every, every one of us is still, is still in the journey, is still in the process. But when you read it out, it seems as if it's superwoman. But then when you increase the numbers, then you realize, oh, so I think it's also good for us to network and identify with each other and kind of check ourselves to see that it helps with the humility when you realize that your last year's achievement was somebody's 2003. As much as you celebrate yourself, it also helps you to push yourself. And when you're doing mentoring, give your mentees chance to network outside of you mm. so they don't um, in, the, in their end, idolize you. And they see there's plenty of you. We had a program that brought together about 360 engineers. And there was a girl who was crying because she had never thought there were that many in one spot. She'd never seen that before. And so then it took the shift off me for them to see that what I've been talking all along, it's normal. It's not Einsteinish. If you want it, you can be it. Mm, thank you very much. And I wanted to add something that sure. I don't think that gender um, equality is about either or, right? I also don't think that it is a mutually exclusive thing that is just about, about women. I think that in general, uh, a lot of this were uh, based on generational mindset, whereby based on culture, religion, and politics, for generations, I think a lot of it, there, there's this mindset and thought or belief systems that are generated from years and years of assuming that if you're a male person, automatically you're likely to be a leader and you could do better. There is also that perception feed, feeding into the fact that because male possess this strong, the idea of strong, and strong is uh, is sort of defined almost as if you have to be physically strong. And, and then men are, are considered to be emotionally more stable and women are. So I think a lot of it is based on perception and prejudice and stereotyping. And I think part of addressing this is not just about the women, 
but it's also about in the general society conscientizing everybody uh, uh, instilling this confidence in women that the idea that you have to stay in the kitchen or the idea that you go to school you can't also make marriage work you go to school you might be a bad wife i think we have to educate girls that they can be successful they can they can also uh, uh, still uh, have, find a husband that just works fine for them, that it's not a bad idea to be an accomplished woman. Mm. At the same time, mm. I think that we all have to educate the male people because a lot of times people even ask and say, mostly women raise children. So how come they, they don't do a good job raising their own male children yeah. to, to, for example, respect women? to know that your sister uh, uh, can equally be confident and you wouldn't find your sister necessarily aggressive for just being confident. The same idea, and in fact, some studies have found that uh, when they presented uh, somebody with the same credentials, the person was a woman, but then they took away the name and then in one case, they made the name Howard. In another case, they made it female. The same credentials, people judge the man in a very positive fashion as opposed to uh, the woman. And, and just because, uh, and why? Because it is based on these assumptions. So essentially what I'm saying is some of the barriers for women's uh, upward movement is perception, mindset, and these cultural beliefs and, and stereotype and prejudice. And I think it has to be deconstructed. We've got to uh, conscientize people and educate men and women that the same thing, if a woman is confident for the same level, it is not a bad idea. It is not arrogance, but it is about building confidence so they can also afford to take risks. Because if they're always labeling women, I don't know how they can be comfortable to take risks because if they're gonna be called names, for the same thing why a man is praiseful, that is not a fair play, uh, a fair playing field. So I think that's what I wanted to emphasize, that it is about behavior changes, cultural belief or uh, change in mindset of all of the society backed by policy. Mm. And the policy okay. is to reinforce that we have to be comfortable that a woman is the president. It's not a bad idea. And you can be emotionally intelligent without necessarily being perceived as aggressive. And I think it's more of a mindset that, uh, that people assume the moment a man is confident, that's fine, but a woman is negative. <clears throat> Sorry. And that's why we have to be educating people. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you all very much. I, it's getting very, very interesting here. And um, we also have one of our uh, regular panelist, also the CEO of South Africa, who has an intervention or has a question also to ask him. Hello, Albert, are you on the line? Yeah, I'm here. Please keep it snappy for us because of our yeah, time. Yeah, actually, I just wanted to, I just wanted to put, you know, I mean, that is, that is a fantastic, I mean, job you guys are doing, brilliant display of, of, of knowledge and ideas. And I think if, if people could listen to you guys, especially this wonderful woman, I think it could change narratives about, about women in leadership. And I, I, I've been following and I, I, I'd also try to encourage discussions on social media and see how people are also bringing out some of the, some of the, um, um, the, the, the suggestions and rebuttals and also some point about some of the discussions that are ongoing. I would like to put a few so that you can you can just move on so i was asking on facebook why why like um why people see women who step out who speak out and women who are bold and confident who has why do people see them as arrogant like mrs Dima said and these are some of the comments people are making one um jesse jesse Apreku is saying that it is a man's world and she thinks that uh, louise armstrong is right even when women are ambitiously pursuing their career, they are called names. So then another guy, Bright Amuzu, is also saying he, he disagrees that if you're arrogant, he thinks that if you're arrogant, you are, you are at it. It has gone, it has got nothing to do with calling women who speak out in politics just as men will be described as arrogant as and when he acts as such. So shall a woman in politics also 
or even if it be described as arrogant. If you are constructive, you are not likely to be described as arrogant. And there are very decent and vocal female politicians. Nobody has at least described them as arrogant. She thinks. One person is also saying that not all of them. The last one, please. Not all of them. She thinks that the Vodil Queen is not about boldness, but sheer arrogance because power has entered her head very deep. I don't actually understand this one. But anyway, anyway, that's, yeah, that's So fine. those are some of the, so maybe later I'll also read some of the other comments people have also put so that it becomes lively and we can also get people's, um, uh, people's um, what people also think about some of the discussions that are ongoing. Mm. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And one, one quick statement in that response. Research support that for the same behaviors. So it's not about women acting different. What the point I'm making is for the same behaviors, men and women are judged different. Women are judged more harsh. That's the whole point. Mm. Thank you. Thank you very much. And yeah. Okay, we, we move on to the second round. I actually also had a question that maybe I should ask before we go to the second round, because it's also in relation to some of the comments that we received. In some cases also, do you think that women sometimes oversimplify things? Because sometimes a woman or the competence of a woman is attacked, and not necessarily her person. We hear people who would emphasize that I am not attacking the person. I'm attacking her skills or her knowledge or her competences. But still, you find women running with it and saying that it's an attack on, on women. Why, why do we often have this? So, so women immediately generalize that it's an attack on the person. Meanwhile, the person might be specific and say that I am challenged, you know, I'm attacking her skills or her knowledge. As one commenter said that usually it's not as if we say women are arrogant. If she is arrogant, then she's arrogant. It's not because women are arrogant per se. But if a man is also arrogant and we say a man is arrogant, you usually do not find men saying that they, they are referring to all men as arrogant. Why do women, or is, or is it the case that women often oversimplify and generalize, you know, personal attack, even if it's a, an attack on their competence? Is that addressed to me? Yes, or to anyone, but you can start if you... I, I disagree. Mm -hmm. I think that I wouldn't necessarily see uh, something I did or something I... Uh, first of all, it's a combination of factors. The manner, I would start by saying the manner in which we're raised is often even different, right? There is, are you raised in general, I mean, we're raised to sort of assume this humble, uh, that doesn't mean humility is bad, but we assume the definition of humility is quite different for women. So the expectation is, for example, you don't normally speak up. Uh, so, so it gets into women's head. It gets into a boy's head. Um, the perception that, uh, for, for, again, so, so, and women and men are assessed differently because people assume that our, our biological features affect our performance and that is a general perception mm. and and mm. let's not pick one case i'm talking about a general perception of how in general women are perceived because keep in mind we're looking at why women are kept down so so structural factors are part of it because because again the way in which we're raised we don't even get opportunities to go and hang out if you, if you take many African communities, men, for example, as children are allowed to go and play soccer and what have you, the woman is always doing chores. Mm. And then the, the, the judge performance that you didn't do well, that's not fair. Yeah. So, so, so to me, uh, so women are disadvantaged through these structural things. So they don't get a chance to network some more. And then, and then on top of it, they're expected to perform all these multiple roles at home care for their grandmother, care for husband's wife, care for uh, mother, care for another alien mother. So, so again, it is kind of their automatic role. So there's a, this overwhelming 
burden that whether you support it for them to do it or not, it affects the time available for them to be able to do more things as men have the opportunities. Plus, not to talk about even some families, they discriminate in terms of how resources are apportioned. Mm. Plus, the perceptions. Perceptions, women are prejudiced, whether you like it or not. They're prejudiced. You express yourself, you're emotional. So I, I wouldn't necessarily, and I always say, uh, uh, even, for example, when they put a, a vice presidential nominee down, for example, when they cr were criticizing, people wanted to make it about women. I know a lot of people were criticizing me for not jumping in. I said, I don't know the woman. I need some time to learn about her record, not just because I'm a woman. I would uh, automatically jump in and support. I need to wait and see what her performance is. I don't want to make it about a woman being a woman, because mm. if we want to mm. be judged the same, I shouldn't complain when my work is being scrutinized. So mm. my, from my perspective, perhaps other women would, but if I want to be considered equally competent and I want to compete with a man, I want to be judged on my work, not on the fact that I'm a woman in the same manner. I don't want to be shut down because I want to actually raise something or I want to confront the man because they did something wrong. I don't want to be perceived as aggressive. And they did it to Hillary. She talks and she raised her voice. She did that. She did that. But the man can actually insult and get away with it. Imagine the woman say something 1%. She'll be condemned totally. The whole part is, I don't want to take the whole stage. I'd like to allow the whole thing is, we masculinize leadership role. And that's the general perception. And that's what needs to be confronted. It is backed by institutional uh, kind of beliefs and structures. Even the, the, the environment in which we perform was structured just to favor men. So, so those are the things we need to yeah. fix. So we change our mindset. Right. Right Thank you very much. Um, um, engineer Amo Edu, you had an intervention, right? You wanted to. Yes, mm -hmm. I, I, I support what Mrs. Juma is saying. I do not agree that it's true, but assuming that it was, I, I would say that if you are born into a field that you are scrutinized, overly scrutinized, and you're always judged before your work even appears, you put yourself in a defensive mode. And so you, you, you develop that coping mechanism due to what you are subjected to. And so we all have these um, learned abilities to survive in the, in the system. Mm. And so if, if the scrutiny would be fair, I'm sure all of us also play fair. And there's also strength in numbers. The stereotyping, the only, the only way we see out of the stereotyping is when we increase our numbers. We're having all these challenges because the fact that I can even single out women who have done well in academia, it's a negative because academia is a whole industry on its own. And we have a huge population. And so if I can single out names, that means there's a lot of work to be done. When we get to the point that there's a balance, there's a, there's a fair, um, there's a fair assessment, there's a fair representation of both genders, and then that is when we can say that okay, it's a it's a fair game. Mm. I don't know if Mrs. Opoku or Miss Lasse, you have something to add. If not, we can start with the second round. Okay. I guess this is not the case. Oh, Mrs. Opoku, you, you have something to add? No, I just wanted to say I agree with my colleagues here on the panel. I don't agree that, um, you know, the playing field is equal. Mm. And um, women in general, you know, like Mrs. Jima said that we're raised, some of us are raised in a home where we're taught to be humble, to talk a certain way, to behave a certain way. Um, if not, you're not, you're not gonna attract a husband. You're not gonna attract good things for yourself. You know, the, always is the emphasis is that, yeah, you may have a career, but family and childbearing should be also a priority. Mm. So, um, yeah. again, I, I agree with what my colleagues have said on this panel. Thank you very much. Um, Ms. Lassie? I just wanted to agree with all my colleagues on the panel. Yeah, I mean, 
um, we must call it spade a spade and not a big spoon. So if somebody is doing something that is right, we should be able to support. And if it's not, we should be able to get right. And that's why mm. we are fighting for it for all Okay. Yes. So thank you all very much. And we immediately start with the second round. We have quite a um, limited time. But in this round, basically what we want to unpack is, you know, what can be done to improve women seeking some of these leadership roles. And I start with you again, Miss Lassie. Uh, I think that Mrs. Jima already touched on bringing in men, you know, when in an attempt to improve uh, the participation of women in, in various leadership roles. And so the question we ask um, is that, what role do you think women and men, but in particular men, because we've heard quite a lot from, from women and we would also hear from the other panelists uh, what they can do, but what, what role do you think women and men can play to change the, the narratives of leadership in, in Africa in, in, in future? Can you, can you please uh, unmute? Thank you. Yeah, I forgot about that. Thank you. So I wanted to just thank my colleagues for their inputs, because most of these have been addressed with what we have been presenting so far. So uh, I have itemized some points, and the first one is equal opportunity to women to thrive. Yeah, so the mere fact that you are a man that's not put you in front of we are both human and capable in areas we are trained and should also have the equal opportunity to achieve in our academic leadership goals and political goals in Africa in future. Um, also, we're talking about the change in the perception of who, what, and how the African woman should believe, behave, and will carry herself to the detriment of the academic process. progress. Sorry, so women should not be put in, in, in a tiny bottle. This is where you belong, and that is it. We should. The perception about who a woman is has to change. Um, for instance, growing up in, in a home where my father was in the military, and my father taught me that I could become anything, and he's my number one fan. Whatever I want to pursue, he's right there with me. Yeah, you can do it, you can go for it. So sometimes, you see, that has played a very significant role in my journey, my academic journey. So as parents, uh, start from there. As the father, you are the first man that your daughter has seen and know, and however you train them, and irrespective of what they hear from outside, if you put into the foundation, we are able to help tilt the perception into a more positive atmosphere. Also, we need support from the, our male counterparts. Um, they should support the women by being available to mentor and see them as equal and not inferior or subordinate to the men. Um, my next point is on inclusion. If this is my current topic. Uh, for my research as I'm doing, so I'm very, very inclined to that. So we often hear, and, and I want to raise a point that was made by Engineer Adu. Um, she talked about the increased numbers of diversity of women, which she was able to itemize um, in the whole of Africa and the globe in general. So now the problem is, we, we appreciate the fact that we have, you know, we have an increased representation but that is not enough to put us in where we want to be. So they have given, now when you talk about, we've given you diversity, what more do you want? We want inclusion. You have to be put at the table and have to be mute and not to take any of your submission. It's as good as not being given the opportunity at all. And so we are asking that the fact that the method that to increase our capacity and from also um, Mrs. Jima also talked about the percentage of um, the women uh, diversity that has increased around the globe. We want to be included. And so if you give us the same inwardness, we need to be able to thrive and 
function as women uh, in various opportunities that we are given. Uh, most importantly, to, to, uh, women should not be afraid to venture into any leadership roles in organization. The backlash is imminent and it will come. There is no two ways about that, so we have to be strong. Currently, we have like all top 10 African women who are really pursuing greater things, you know, this time from Spain. I'll just mention a few, like from Sawar, Akanosh, or oh, please forgive me for the pronunciation, um, from Morocco. She's the head of group in Toyom, Luxury Goods and Retail. We have Hajia Bolin Shadai in Nigeria, Oil, Real Estate, Banking, Communication. And there was one that stuck out to me, um, Ibongya Sambo in South Africa, who was rejected in her fight to become a flight attendant, and then she started her own aviation business. And so women, we are going to get the backlash of pushback so we can be able to do it. We have a lot of examples for us to do it. And then finally, talking about the mentors, uh, we do not necessarily have to have a direct access to your mentor. Now, due to technology, you can have a mentor from afar. So what you can do is to look into the industry that you are interested in, and then look at those people who have been able to achieve the level that you want to. You can follow them on Twitter, LinkedIn, and see the career path that they took. It will be very helpful in your quest to um, embarking on your career, academic, leadership, and political journey and to draw inspiration. Mm, thank you. Thank you very much. And yeah, I like uh, one of the perspectives that you brought in the beginning from the home, as, as they say in the Bible, if you train up the child in the way he should go. Uh, and the, but because also Mrs. Chima already touched on, um, yeah, uh, was it Mrs. Chima or one of you touched on the fact that women should also you know, educate their male sons because usually we we are being left to to misbehave sometimes. And so I like where you brought in the fathers should be able to push and be the number one supporters of their daughters, and of course the mothers also not being a supporter of their sons, but you know trying to strengthen them. But both ways, all parents should be able to do the job of you know educating their kids to understand that. Equality is very, very important. Thank you very much, Ms. Lassie. And um, I come to you, Engineer uh, Amu Edu. So yeah. the, the question I we want to ask you now is, yes, we know it's not been easy for women. We've talked about some of the qualities with which some women have been able to use to get to the top despite the, the, the difficulties that they, they, they face. But the question we ask you is that in moving forward, what do you think uh, are the more leadership qualities, you know, that should be essential to the African uh, woman aiming to hold top leadership positions? Besides those that we have um, heard about, what, what, what would be some of the qualities you expect women to, to possess in order to hold top positions? Okay, um, thank you for the question. For my experience, I would say that every woman is naturally a leader because of the multitasking that is expected of us from society. So I'll take it from the angle of economizing care. Every woman is expected to care. She's expected to care for her children, her parents, her friends, her husband, it's whether you know how to do it or not, you're not even asked, you're just assumed that you can care. But society does not place a premium on care. So if we can monetize care, and then the woman can have a choice to care or to pursue other things. I think that would be the first stop for me. We should monetize and prioritize care and not take for granted the contribution of females in that industry. And second, I would like to just wrap it up with my experience as a negotiator during the climate change uh, conference. We call it the Conference of the Parties uh, since 2013. And I was automatically put on the gender table when I wanted to be on the technology table because I was a female. 
And my, my experience through that is that sometimes as women, when you're placed in the wrong seat based on your gender, you need to fight for what you want. I had to physically say exactly what I want. Maybe I had to overly justify my inclusion. But today I'm on the table that I'm happy with, that I'm negotiating with for my country. And so sometimes when we are put in seats that we do not want, we should verbally say it and we should bring out our grievances in a way that will get us to where we really want to go. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, engineer. And yeah, that was, um, but because you shared your experience, which is quite interesting, you know, demanding what, what, what is right for you and did you face, didn't it come with other challenges as well? Or it was, was it that smooth that they, they immediately accepted? I can imagine that you probably might have gone through. <laughs> it was a terrible experience. <laughs> but, uh, but I knew what I wanted and I knew I couldn't get there if I just started speaking. So I did serve on the gender table in 2013 in Paris. And then I started doing pro bono work for the boss or the leader of the technology negotiation table. And he liked my work. And so for the subsequent years, he poached me from the gender table. That's how I operated. Okay, so, so for me, when I'm, when I'm faced with an obstacle, I decide instead of churning out my grievances, it's not fair. It will never be fair. That's what I've put in my mind. What I do is how do I get to where I want to get? And if it takes time, it will still happen. Mm. Okay. Yes. And so that's how I went about it. Thank you very much. And I think that also stresses the point one of you made you, or one, one of you said the mother said, you walk the walk and talk the talk. So at least you had something to show that you, you're capable of being included. That. Thank you. Um, Mrs. Jim, I would like to come to you before I finally go to Mrs. Opoku. We, we've heard a lot about this affirmative action, you know, and um, we, we wanted you to tell us, what, what do we know about that and what's the effect? Has it done anything to improve women occupying top leadership positions currently? In general, uh, my understanding of affirmative action is because the playing is not fair, like all the other things we talked about, um, meaning that just because we're male versus female, we're perceived different. That also comes with being male and female offered different opportunities. Because of these factors, I think the goal of affirmative action, as far as I'm aware, is to remove these barriers that inhibit women's progress. For example, policies, attitudinal changes, Right, so, so starting with a, uh, an awareness as you're doing, as we're doing right now, around uh, in our households, uh, and then by educating women, the women themselves will be able to educate, properly educate their sons and daughters. First of all, their sons to be confident that you can go to school and still have even a better husband than if you don't, and then educate their sons to be respectful when they marry, to treat women nicely, to encourage their daughters. So then when they have girl child, they wouldn't be discouraged and keep waiting for boys. Their girl children can equally be better. So these are the, some of the barriers, I think that affirmative action, and particularly in politics, for example, people are advocating that uh, equal opportunities be created, numbers. And I think in Africa, for example, some of the things that are, some of the other countries that are doing very well uh, are Rwanda. Uh, Rwanda, and I do believe in Namibia and South Africa, I think they're the three countries that have uh, are almost the, like gender parity in their, in their parliament, as well as uh, cabinet positions. Recently in Canada, I think our current government had 50% female on cabinet. Right, he made it as a conscious effort to put female there. Because many of the females, before you actually, as a woman, you rise to that political position, you would have overcome so many of the things we talked about, probably many more times 
then I'm sorry to say what a man could have uh, battled with because of all the other reasons we mentioned, because of the prejudice, because of the, uh, uh, the barriers you have to fight for your position. So for a woman to, to get to that level, they're equally accomplished. So what the prime minister did was to make it as a conscious effort, my cabinet out of the 100, 50% uh, female uh, and 50% uh, males. And, and we have women like that and they've all performed very well. The other things that I think that you're saying that is that helping? I think a lot of people, uh, some people are against it. Um, I have my own reservation against one of it. One, one thing I don't want it to be against, some men uh, or, or some people in general feel if we are claiming we're competent, then why do we have to be given a free pass? <laughs> Almost like we're handed that position. Some people think that way. Um, I, feel, I do feel given the barriers, there has to be at least a limit uh, kind of a firm numbers given. Uh, the affirmative action sort of created at different levels. For example, encouraging parents or mandating that uh, every child has equal opportunities for school. Uh, children equal, equally have uh, uh, different levels of opportunities for like playtime to develop their brains properly to network also when they're in university. So equally given equal access. In Africa, one of the other things is on equal access to capital for women in, in, in businesses, women in entrepreneurship. So those kinds of things, I think that the affirmative action would help because the woman is skilled, probably. They have the business mentality in my mind. They shouldn't be discouraged or be kept out because of discrimination. So yes, affirmative action, I think they're helpful. And it is just to sort of remove the discrimination that just being a woman, if it wasn't for you being a woman, you couldn't access capital, you couldn't access education, you couldn't access that position. And that has to, in my mind, stop. Uh, although some women would like to stay at home, for example, no matter what, and look after their husbands, that's a choice and that's fine. But they should be given a choice, but it shouldn't be penalized especially for the women that would go, uh, go uh, uh, out there and work because women can balance working and then take on their uh, uh, family roles as well and raise their children. And the other part of it is uh, around affirmative action that I heard other countries, especially the Scandinavian countries are doing well, is flexibility around workplaces. So then uh, an accommodation around maternity leave, fraternity leave, so then they're also granting males in Canada, we have that as well. So then the woman could take six months as a, uh, a maternity leave, and then the one year they could split it up so the man can also take paternity leave to look after the children. Those kinds of affirmative actions, I think that if it is fair for the men, uh, and it is not based on maybe doing us quote unquote a favor, uh, that that's fine but uh, if it is on to to sort of remove discrimination i support it and i think that should be helpful because it is not fair for women to be left out just because of just being a woman uh for that reason thank you thank you thank you very much for that wonderful input um i would have to reserve my follow-up questions because of time but mrs opoku so we've we've had from Mrs. Jima, the affirmative action, which is more towards improving uh, political leadership, I would say. We've also heard from engineer the qualities that women bring on board and the role of men and women as well from Ms. Lassie. For you, if you sum it up, what, what do you think are some of the unique opportunities that women have to you know, explore when they are applying to these leadership roles? I'm sorry, the, your last part cut off, so I didn't hear that. Sorry. So I was asking that, what, what kind of unique opportunities do you think women have on their hand to, to explore or to use when, when they are applying to these highest leadership positions? Okay. Well, I have a, a checkmark list that I also created for myself that I'll share. But I want to add to Mrs. Addo's um, 
statement earlier about how we should monetize care. I, whole, I wholeheartedly agree with that. I think we should create a business and start doing that, Mrs. Adu. If mourners can get paid in Ghana to just go and mourn, I think we can also monetize care. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> um, one of the things I want to add to that is that we should not be afraid to take initiative to engage in senior management. I think uh, a lot of us sometimes feel as though that maybe we're inadequate and we should not feel that way. We are adequate with whatever resources that we have. So to take a page out of the book of leadership, always feel as though that you're adequate and that you can apply for these positions. Never feel shy away that because your resume does not par with another colleague, um, I believe everybody brings a unique sense of abilities to a job and never feel if you have that drive and you have that passion and you have that perseverance, you will succeed. And I think another thing is to also make sure that you are courageous. You know, there is, there's, there's so much to contend with. And I think if you have that quality of being courageous and not being fearful, it will get you a long way in business and in life in general. And a no today is not a no forever. I'll give you a short story. When I started my career, I was in sales and I used to work for Coca-Cola and I used to have an account in the city in Manhattan and I used to have this one particular account, um, a store I should say, that every time I would go in there, he would say no. Didn't want to sell, he didn't want to buy our products. Didn't want to see Coca-Cola for whatever reason, he had a sour taste with our brand and didn't want to buy any sales from me. But what I continually did was I kept showing up. I kept showing up and I kept offering him services and I kept talking to him. And all the time he was showing me away and said, oh, I don't have time, I don't have time, I barely have time to eat. And that was, I guess, the opening, the window for, for me to engage with him. Because he was so busy and he didn't have enough time to eat, I would make sure I would prepare food and take it to him. So every time I got to his account, I would, well, jollof rice was something I figured everybody would like and enjoy. So I would prepare jollof rice and fried chicken. And every time I went to his account, I would give it to him. First couple of times, he didn't even want to look at me. After a week or so, he welcomed it. He said, oh, am I going to get jollof rice tomorrow? And I said, certainly. And I would bring him jollof rice. And after a month of just engaging with him, he started to place an order. He started to buy sales from me. So I say this story to say that a no today is not a no forever. Always persevere, always continue. If it's your dream, if it's your passion, if it's your goal, you should never let anyone deter you from that or any situation deter you from that. Because I believe in those brief you know, um, circumstances where you feel there's obstacles, there's room for triumph. Um, another thing is that I would increase your circle, you know. Sometimes we are a creature of habit and we want to be around people who look like us, who are from the same background, the same, in some cases in Africa, the same tribe, but we should increase our circles and see where opportunities lies there as well. Um, be okay to take risks. Failure is not a death sentence. Um, I believe that a lot of experiences and growth come from failure. Um, there's not a successful or uh, uh, a great CEO or a leader who has not failed. If you fail, you learn and you grow from that. Um, and again, be courageous, dream big, always work towards your goal every single day, no matter how small it is, always work towards your goal and never take no for an answer. You know, I believe there's always opportunity. There's a window, you know, as I say, when the door shuts, the, um, God opens a window. So, make that you know your priority wow thank you very much and yeah i know today is not a no forever and i like the perseverance conquers or it's, it's also a motto of one of the senior high schools in ghana oh, i'm sure those who know me can relate so but I, I won't go there um so albert again he's been monitoring the facebook uh, fan base i guess and he wanted to jump in with some comments. Please make it brief because our time is far spent. I've been asked to wrap up. Albert, are you on the line now? Yes, yes, please. Thank you so much for the opportunity. So, so um, another comment someone was making from Amma Usuabwatin was that it's a good question that we ask 
why women who are who speak out and are bold and confident seen as arrogant. Then Kwame, Kwame Dakun is saying it's an average African man's conception or perception or beliefs or state of consciousness about women. For in their miniature accepted dogmas, women are not meant to go higher than men or should be the head. Then Jesse Apreku, Apreku is also accent. Does it mean that it is an average African man syndrome? Please, I submissively need some enlightenment. Then just the last one, mm -hmm. the last one about uh, uh, why Mrs. Jima said we have only 25% of parliamentarians in Africa being, being women. Actually, and, it was in the world, right? Mrs. Jima was a global. Uh, anyway, go ahead, Albert, whilst she might clarify later. So, um, one man, my friend from Ethiopia, is asking to world day. Even worse, these are not properly selected or empowered, but are purposely, purposely picked. Then Owusu, Owusu Tebia, who is the vice president of South Africa, is asking, so who calls them? <laughs> yeah, so these are some of the some main of the, people. Are, well, okay. So if thank you can provide some brief rebuttals, thank you so much. Thank you, thank you very much, um, Albert Kobena. Yes, so I find the, if I can come in. Yeah, sure, go I ahead. Coming from the Ethiopian, very interesting because we have an Ethiopian female president, Swok, President Swok, and uh, yeah, to find to find someone from that country. But um, Rwanda alone has 57, 57.7 percent of its parliamentarians being female. I think that's the best in the world so far. Mm, true. Yeah. Um, Mrs. Jima, you, well, but I think, okay, go ahead. Yeah, I think the numbers were uh, like Africa, the cabinet, the average Africa was 22%. And then for parliamentarians, 25%. Mm -hmm. And USA was, uh, as of 2016, I believe, was a cabinet 27%. And then uh, 2019, um, those women on corporate board in the USA was 25.9 percent, and mm. that was an increase from 18.9 percent in 2015 in US. So um, I think the Ethiopian one was quite noted, and then those other African countries, Rwanda, South Africa, and I do believe uh, the other one, Namibia. I believe they're the, the countries with. 50% or about parity, gender parity in Africa. Okay, thank you. thank you, thank you very much. And I think this is where we would have to draw the, the curtain. But before that, I would love to hear your concluding remarks on this topic of women and leadership in Africa. But in particular, I know you wonderful women out here, you are an inspiration to young women out there. So as you conclude on the topic also, what would be your your, your remarks to young women, but also to young men who do not see the need for, you know, women occupying top positions. So I, I'd like to start with um, Mrs. Opoku. Oh, my message to young leaders of the future, be courageous, seek mentors. Um, uh, one of our colleagues on the panel said that social media plays a big part in businesses. And I, I agree, now you can access leaders easily or people that you look up to more easily on social media. Don't be afraid to engage um, with people. And, you know, persevere. You know, if, you, if, it's, if it's your dream, if it's what you want to aspire to do and if it's your calling, don't let anyone or anything stand in your way. Um, you mentioned, um, one of the, I guess the persons on Facebook mentioned that why are women looked on as um, being too aggressive. Um, when you start reaching, when you start growing in your career and your, um, your success in life, people are always going to have something to say. My mom has always taught me that when you do good, they're going to talk about you. When you do bad, they're going to talk about you. So the best thing you have to do is just live your life. And it's hard, I know, in the beginning to kind of like block your ears and not listen to the naysayers or the negative talk, but you have to stay, 
really on chart with your goals and don't let anything sway you. And people are always going to talk. People, I mean, that's, that's a given. People are always going to talk. So if they're going to talk, give them something worth talking about. Do, you know, have stuff to back it up, you know, mm. and that would be my, my, my suggestion. Mm. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mrs. Opoku. I come to you, Miss Lassie. What, what will be your concluding remarks? Thank you. So my concluding remarks so far will be um, to our men to support their women. Do not be afraid of the fact that your woman wants to achieve and especially going through the academic ladder. You shouldn't be afraid to marry a woman who is advanced and has succeeded. Know that if you support your wife to, to go far in life, you are building, she's gonna help you build generational wealth for you and your family. So that is one of the reasons why in Africa, the men normally will work, 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 work till they drop dead. They'll die, you know, <laughs> die earlier, leaving the woman alone because you want to carry everything on your head. Your woman can also support you. So both of you can enjoy what you each bring to the table and have the longevity of life. Mm. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Lasse. I come to you, engineer Araba Amu Edu. What will be your concluding remarks? Thank you once again for a very lovely intellectual discourse. My conclusion will be that everybody was created with a purpose, with a focus, an objective, an aim in mind. Find your purpose and be intentional about it. Focus on your purpose and it will come to pass. Thank you. And Mrs. Jima. Thank you. And first of all, it's been a real pleasure. I think everybody did a fabulous job. And you as the moderator, you did a fantastic job. I think that was a very interesting topic. Uh, in general, how I'd like to conclude is uh, in most societies and globally, women constitute a little over half of the world's population. I'd like to also say that uh, our abilities, strength, and capacities are not necessarily based on our gender. And leadership position does not necessarily have to be based on whether you have male or female figures. I think we need to give people a chance to assess their capabilities, assess people on com uh, on competence of their abilities rather than just looking out and minimizing. It is, uh, it is about time we went past the assumption that as a woman, they cannot lead. Leadership doesn't require physical, physical abilities. It does require intelligence. And intelligence, I don't know whether there is any scientific support that support scientific literature that support that just being a male necessarily give you an automatic leadership skills. It is acquired through knowledge, skills development, confidence, and, and even the manner in which you're raised as well as the culture. So we need, as a society, we need to, to give people a chance. We need to give women a chance. I understand women influence 80% of consumption, global consumption. I also learned that excluding women in leadership position actually costs the globe $160 trillion a year. So, so I think that there is a consensus that there, uh, there a growing body of research that support that including women is actually beneficial. Educating women uh, makes them make better choices. A woman who goes past high school uh, actually increases uh, the, uh, their chances of giving birth early. It, it, it also uh, decreases uh, child marriage. So it has so many benefits. Plus being educated means that you're educated around the right way of educating your child, making right choices around your health. So it is only beneficial. As women also, I think that we need to build our confidence. We need to search whether that's male role model or female role model that has the qualities that you can emulate, that you can learn from. I think we need to take chances. The other advice for women is besides taking right, uh, risk, we are asked to um, almost like move away from their supporting roles, even at work, the work that is not visible. That's what we often volunteer to do. We should do a lot of the one that men do. So those are some of the skills we should learn from men. 
besides taking risks, they sell themselves well. So we should be confident to sell our skills and promote ourselves and be comfortable about criticisms and move ahead, as my other colleagues have said. Otherwise, I agree with all the other things they highlighted. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. I have enjoyed the show today. And yeah, we're grateful to Mrs. Opoku, who joined us from the US, Ms. Lasse from the US as well, Mrs. Jima from Canada, and Engineer Edu from Germany. And for me, what I have learned as a, as a man, you know, is that we need to support the women who intend to seek leadership positions. And so I throw the challenge to all men out there, support your wives, support your sisters, support your daughters, support every woman who intends to hold a leadership position. And as Mrs. Jima said, as my concluding remark is that leadership requires intelligence, not physical abilities. I am Evans Apia Kisi. This has been SEPSA Talk. Thank you very much and see you another time. Bye-bye.